Hey everyone. So I thought I would do a video on the biggest lessons and takeaways I have from building my off-grid workshop. So I haven't gone into detail and really shown my workshop off. I did show off my setup, but I will go into more detail on my full setup and my sort of full workshop when I finish the interior and it doesn't look like a construction site. But I built an off-grid workshop. Uh, it's a three kilowatt array and I have a 16S 48 uh, volt life post system that's around 14 kilowatts. It's the big 280 amp hour Eve cells that I used to build it. Uh, it took me probably in the order of three to six months to put it all together. Uh, and I want to talk about the biggest lessons I learned while building this. The first thing that I'm learning uh, is that you should buy a larger array. So let's say you think you need three kilowatts, right? That's what I thought I needed. So I thought three kilowatts, you know, where I am, I should average around five hours of sunlight a day, especially in the summertime. Uh, great, I'll get around 15 kilowatts a day. And when the weather's good, I get 15 kilowatts and I can even get more than 15 kilowatts. But if it's a cloudy day, I might only get, you know, three or four kilowatts. If it's a cloudy day for two days in a row, I could be looking at really small amounts of energy. And, you know, three or four days of cloudy weather and I'm looking at having, you know, a pretty paltry system, right? I'm looking at only around four kilowatts a day for a whole week, potentially. Um, it'd be really nice if I had a larger array, right? And when it comes to buying solar panels, oftentimes the biggest cost is shipping. I have 300 watt panels. The shipping was $300, but each panel only actually cost me around $100 because I found a great deal on Santan Solar. So, you know, I bought what I thought I needed, but in hindsight, I wish I just bought three more. If I wanted to order three more, uh, three more solar, solar panels now, I'd end up, you know, paying $600 versus if I just paid for three more then and I'd have $300. It only cost me $300. So the time to build a bigger array is not in the future, it's now. Now, maybe you have access to your solar panels locally and shipping's not a factor, or maybe it's really easy for you to add to your array. Uh, maybe it's ground-based or something like that. But for me, it would have just been much easier to pay a little bit of extra money, buy some more, uh, buy at least two more uh, panel arrays, oversize, oversize my system by 10% or 20%, and, um, and do it all when I was installing it, rather than trying to expand it later. I think I'll get by with what I had, but if I could spend the money now and have a bigger array, I would definitely do it. Related to that is oversize your solar charge controller and oversize your inverter. Uh, solar charge controllers are great and they're an amazing tool, but if you buy one that fits your array perfectly, that means you can't expand your array at all. That means you, if you wanna have any flexibility in how you're arranging your strings or, your, or, or putting things in parallel, you might have difficulty because you have a very narrow range because you, you bought a very specific solar charge controller, maybe the, the, the one that has you know, the most affordable, the lowest amperage and the lowest voltage you could possibly get that we could afford that could accommodate your array. Buy something with higher voltages and they can high, accommodate higher amperages. That'll give you a lot of flexibility. That means you can sort of expand your array, but it could also mean you could reorganize things, right? Maybe put more things in strings, create bigger strings and have fewer, uh, fewer parallel, something like that. Um, larger solar charge controllers just give you a lot of flexibility and the cost is usually minor. You're usually increasing cost by $100 or $200 and you're buying yourself a lot of freedom. Uh, if you change your mind in the future and your solar charge controller doesn't work, well, now you're gonna have to sell it maybe on eBay or something like that. You'll probably lose half the value of it and then you'll have to buy a new one and you'll end up costing yourself, you know, two or $300 to upgrade at least versus if you just spend an extra 100, 150 on the outset. So Will Prowse talks about this and I think he's totally right. Oversize your, oversize your solar charge controller. The other thing I'd say, do the same for your inverter. Uh, don't cheap out and get the smallest inverter you think you can handle. If you're running anything large, anything that's an inductive load, so something like uh, an air conditioning unit, um, if you're running tools, um, I'm using a dust collector, anything that could have what's called an inductive load, and if you have something that you're not certain about, just Google it and see if it's an inductive load, they surge, right? They might only pull a thousand watts, but they might start by pulling 3000 watts or more. If you undersize your inverter, you might really struggle to power some of your larger loads and you just lose flexibility. If you have a great system and it's working well, you're gonna find that you're gonna employ it more and more and more. You're gonna think, oh, maybe I'll use this. Maybe I wanna do this. You're, if anything, you're, you know, what you plan to use, that's the floor, right? Hey, I think I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. That, that's the minimum of what you're gonna do, what you're gonna do. Over time, you're gonna find, you know, all other sorts of things that you wanna do in your system too. And if your inverter isn't really big enough, you're gonna find that you max out, right? Uh, you're gonna, your inverter is gonna let you down and it's just better to pay up a little bit more, have a bigger inverter, especially something that can, hand, can handle uh, big surges because you don't know, uh, if you're not careful, you might be surprised at how many things actually surge. 
Additionally, if you have a big inverter, you're gonna be taxing it a lot less when you do some of these loads. If you have a smaller inverter and it's a hot day and you're really taking it to its limit, you're gonna really heat that thing up. It's really gonna be challenged. It's really gonna have a hard time and you're much more likely to damage your inverter and just burn it out if you're, if you're at its peak capacity a lot of the time. Whereas if you have a bigger inverter and you're only using 50% of its capacity or 25% of its capacity, I think it's much more likely, likely to last longer. And again, upgrading your inverter could be a really costly and time consuming process. So I would say just get the bigger inverter at the outset and pro tip, get split phase. Split phase means that you can do 220 volts or 240, whatever you want to call it. And it just makes it a lot easier for you. You can wire outlets that can do AC machines or cool tools or just gives you a lot more flexibility. So I would say go split phase if you can. Um, another thing related to your array is I would say buy a, a solar combiner box. I constructed my own solar combiner box because I couldn't find anything that really fit my needs. And I also thought solar combiner process solar combiner prices were crazy. I was seeing things for like $200, $300, $400. And I was like, this is nuts. This is just a few circuit breakers in a box. Like I can do this myself. I ended up building it myself and it basically cost the same. It was, took a lot of time. Uh, There's a lot of research involved and it's not a professional thing. I, I made it myself, right? Uh, at the end of the day, I probably saved myself a very little money, especially because I ordered some of the wrong things and couldn't return them, et cetera. So I maybe not saved any money at all. Uh, whereas I could have just spent the money and had something professional and something that I know would work. So my advice is if you're really not sure about the solar uh, combiner box, just err on the side of buying it. I know there's a lot of bad products out there. Will Prowse has been talking about that too. Um, I would say do your research, but all else equal, I would spend the money on the solar combiner box as painful as it may be. Now related to that, if you're building a system with DC power, you're probably gonna think about fuses and circuit breakers. Now, I don't have a lot of advice about fuses. Um, I've gotten some good comments from readers about how I bought the, potentially the wrong fuse. Uh, definitely be careful and make sure that your fuses are rated for the voltages you're using because you know if they're not, even though the fuse blows, the electricity could still arc. But if you're gonna use circuit breakers, be aware that DC circuit breakers are not like AC circuit breakers. First, you can't use an AC circuit breaker in a DC setting. Just don't do it. But secondly, there are two types of DC circuit breakers. There's polarized and non-polarized. This is a polarized circuit breaker. And the way you know is that it's got this plus and this minus up here. Some circuit breakers, some polarized circuit breakers will have a plus and minus and a plus and minus on the bottom as well. And they've got these symbols about how they should be used. The most important thing about polarized circuit breakers is they're not designed to be interchangeable in terms of how they're wired. If I have battery over here and PV array over here, it's not okay for me to switch and have this be one way or the other. They have to be oriented in a certain way. In particular, they're supposed to be oriented such that the higher potential energy source comes in, I think at this plus minus and comes out over here. And if you orient them the wrong way and they get a surge in the wrong direction, these can light up on fire and obviously that's not what we want. That's very bad, right? So polarized circuit breakers have to be used in very specific ways. And I've heard a lot of discussion online about how they're not appropriate to use with your PV array or this or that. So I don't like using polarized circuit breakers. I buy non-polarized circuit breakers. There's a big difference and make sure that you're, you know what you're doing if you're gonna use DC circuit breakers. Decide if you're gonna use polarized or non-polarized and then know what you're doing. I've also heard that a lot of the polarized circuit breakers you're getting from AliExpress or from Amazon might not be the best quality. People, some people don't trust them. It's all complicated, I wish it was easy, but just know that there's a big difference between polarized and non-polarized and know what you're getting into and do your research. Uh, and if you're not comfortable with that, you can always just use fuses and then use some connect switch, uh, like DC disconnect switches. So you could always just have on and off uh, with a DC disconnect and combine it with a fuse and skip the whole circuit breaker bonanza or scandal, whatever you wanna call it. But be aware about your DC circuit breakers. The other thing I'd say is if you're building your, your system, oversize everything. If you think you'll be fine with two gauge or you think you'll be fine with four gauge, upgrade to two. Um, if you think uh, you, know, you, you don't have enough, if you think you only need 10 feet of wire, buy 15. Everything I've discovered is you can estimate things, but you're gonna be off by at least a factor of 10%. It's better to just spend the money. You're almost certainly gonna use the items. So buy more and buy bigger stuff than you think you need. Um, bigger stuff because it's way better to err on the side of having a system that is more robust than you think, than it is to less. You don't wanna accidentally have wires that are too small. And buy more just because it's really hard to estimate what you're gonna need. You're gonna end up using it. You will really slow your build down if you're constantly waiting for this part or that part. Uh, another thing related to that is like, for example, lugs, right? These are, this is a lug. Lugs are specific to the wire size they're supposed to be used with. 
Uh, they have specific size holes, so make sure you're measuring what size hole is appropriate. They have like three eighths, five sixteenths, different size holes. If you've got to make sure that it's going to fit over the stud, but that the lock, that the nut that's going to go over and hold this down is also large enough to cover that hole. Uh, but I went through tons of these and I had to order more like two or three times. Um, just order more than you think you need. And if you, if you order way too much, you can return the extra, um, but they're not that expensive and it will massively slow your build down and you don't want to be using the long, wrong lug. So go ahead, order the right stuff and order extra. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, for your BMS, if there's accessories that come with your BMS that you think you might need, go ahead and buy them. My personal experience was I ordered the a smart BMS from Dolly via AliExpress and um, it had a few extra items. It had a touch LCD screen, but it also had this UART to USB converter, which I had no idea what this does. And it also came, it also had a potential, this RS485 CAN converter. Uh, now I didn't know what these were, but I also saw that they were only about $5. And I thought to myself, look, I don't know if I'm gonna need these. I don't think I need them, but they're $5 and I don't wanna spend $5 and $20 in shipping later. Let me buy them now with the product. I'll spend an extra combined, maybe 20 bucks. And I'll have this, you know, insurance in case things go wrong. I'll have the equipment I need to maybe debug things. It turns out it was one of the best decisions I made. Uh, I couldn't get my BMS to work properly. The Bluetooth app didn't work very well. But when I finally used the UART to USB with my computer and the program that uh, Dolly provided, I was able to debug my BMS and it worked a hell of a lot better. So bottom line, be prepared for things to go wrong. If there's a few accessories that you might need to debug your BMS, get them. I know a lot of the simpler BMSs don't have those problems, but if it's a more advanced BMS and there's a wire or something that, hey, do I need Bluetooth or not? Get the Bluetooth. Hey, do I need this extra wire to control it? Get those extra things. If it's not that much money, just be prepared. Don't wait. You don't want to wait two months for something, you know, for two wires to ship from China or have to pay $30 for it to come in two weeks instead. Just get the wires. You never know what's going to go wrong. And even if things work out in the beginning, who knows? Maybe a year from now, you're going to have a bug and it'll be really helpful for me to be able to plug into my BMS. So if there are random accessories that you think you might need, go ahead and get them. Final lesson in all this is sort of contradictory. Firstly, order ahead, right? If it's coming from China, it could take a couple months to get here. Order it now. Don't wait. When you need it, you don't want to sit around and be waiting. On the other hand, when you get things, make sure to test them and test them quickly. If you're getting stuff and it's from AliExpress, you've got 30 days to dispute the transaction. So don't order things and let them sit around and only to discover later on that they don't work. If you order a bunch of battery cells and you don't test their capacity or do anything with them for a month or two, well then if there's capacities don't meet up, uh, match up to what you ordered, you're out of luck. 30 days have passed, you can't dispute, what are you gonna do, right? So when you get things, make sure you test them, test your BMS. Very importantly, test your battery cells, test your inverter. And if you have to spend a little bit of money on the states, on the state side, if you have to buy a power supply maybe from the states or you have to buy some sort of battery monitor, if you have to spend a little bit of money to make sure your stuff works, it's worth it. You'll probably find a use for it later on. Uh, and at bare minimum, you're ensuring that, hey, if I have to dispute this, uh, I can test it now. You don't wanna wait until your system's up and running, maybe a month or two later, only discover that your battery cells don't work or your inverter can't go above 4,000 watts when you buy it, but 8,000 watts, or that your BMS won't allow your batteries to charge. All sorts of problems. You'll be shocked at how many problems you're gonna come across when you're building your system for the first time. Be prepared for things to not work. <clears throat> be prepared for things to not work. Test them when you get them and just be robust. Buy more than you need, oversize things, and be prepared for your system to under deliver. So again, just to repeat, buy a bigger array, buy a bigger star solar charge controller. You're, what you're gonna find is things might not live up to expectations. And at the same time, when things get working, you're gonna wanna put way more demand on your system than you think. Once it's working and you're having a good time and you're getting tons and tons of solar power and your batteries are up and it's all amazing, uh, I find that you know I'm using way more power than I expected just because it's so convenient, it's so awesome. You're, you're getting so much out of it. You just, you're gonna think of things to use it for. And all of a sudden you're gonna wish you had more power. Um, and especially when the weather turns bad, it really sucks. So anyway, <clears throat> please post your comments below. Please like or subscribe. And thank you so much for watching. It means a lot to me.